this is a sermon some of you have been waiting for. You know that? Did you know that? Uh, of the seven stewardship points I want to talk about in this series, one of them, today's message, is on money. Don't you love it when preachers talk about money? No? <laughs> I'm going to tell you, everybody's going to love the sermon today except the people who love money more than God. How many of those do we have? Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, then we'll, we'll try to work on that a little bit. But let's read the passage that we're talking from basically as the foundational passage for this entire series. Matthew 25, 21 says, Well done, good and faithful servants. Well done, good and faithful servant. We want to hear the Lord say that, right? We want to hear him say that at the end of the line, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. That's what we want to hear the Lord say. Amen? We want to hear him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. I talked to you a couple of weeks ago about your body. Managing your body in a way that God would consider good management. I talked to you about last week managing your mind in spite of a microphone that was going nuts. <laughs> we got a message in on how to manage your mind. And today I want to take you to that subject that is a little bit controversial and kind of people can get weird about it, but I want you to remember this. The offering has already been taken. <laughs> the offering's already been taken, so just relax. Take that white knuckle grip off of your wallet or your purse. We're, we're not going to get near it. So let's look at what the Lord says about money. So if you have not been trustworthy and handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches? If you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Now, isn't he saying, I'm going to give you a little bit of money, or maybe more than a little bit of money, and if you will manage it well, I will give you stuff that's really important. I will entrust you with spiritual things that will be really important, but I want to see if you are a good steward. And it's going to be tough for you to believe this, because in our world, money is where most people start and finish everything. Money is sort of everything about their life that, that really excites them, that that's how I start, that's how I end, it's all about money. Well, with God, with Jesus, money is where it starts, and then it goes on to the true treasure. It goes on to responsibilities that have eternal significance after that. So if God gives me an amount of earthly treasure and says, Jeff, if you manage this well, I will trust you with stuff that's really important, isn't that a trust test? Isn't that a trust test? Isn't it a stewardship test? So I want to give you real quickly, I don't know if I'll do quickly or not, but I want to give you as quickly as I can Six things the New Testament says about money. Six financial obligations to do with money. And when I'm done, I'm going to ask you a question. You ready? Maybe go to the last page in your notes. All right? And if you've got a pen there, if you have to have one to write notes or pencil. I want to ask, I'm going to ask you a question when I'm done here in just a few short minutes. <laughs> uh, did Pastor Jeff preach the truth today? And, I, and I, I want you to answer that question. Did Pastor Jeff preach the truth today? Not did I get on your toes. Not did you decide you didn't like me today. But did Pastor Jeff teach the Word of God today? Here is the first obligation. We have an obligation to accurately appraise money. We have a biblical obligation to accurately appraise money. The Bible says, Then Jesus said to them, Watch out! You ever have someone yell, watch out? What do you do? You drop down, you duck. When someone says, watch out, I always imagine a baseball is flying toward my head. I don't know why that is, but I always imagine someone just threw a baseball, and I, if you ever got hit in the head with a baseball, you know it leaves a lasting impression. Come on, folks. Get with me. So, watch out! Not long ago... My wife and I replaced our front door, and we put in a speakeasy. Let me know what a speakeasy is. Speakeasy. You know what a speakeasy is? 
go with speakeasy is this little thing that you open up in the door and you can stick your head out and look around. It's got this little cage, you know. My wife is having second thoughts about it because she's covered it with a wreath. And I've got to wear, when I know she's coming, especially at night, I will open it up and stick my face. And there's this cage around it, you know. And as she gets to the door, I say, watch out! And I'm telling you, it's hilarious. She screams like a werewolf and tries to claw her way through the door with, with, without even opening. It's incredibly funny. I mean, I'll never do it again as long as I live. But when I scream, watch out in that certain voice, it really does something to her. And not in a good way. No. Jesus said, watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Now watch this. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. A lot of people believe their life consists on the abundance of their possessions. We even have a word, what's he worth? Meaning, how much money does he have? How many assets does he have? And Jesus said, watch out. You're going to be tempted to believe your life exists in the stuff you buy. And in the money you have, that is over-appraising money, and that will get you in all kinds of spiritual trouble and probably all kinds of other troubles. Appraise money as unworthy of your heart's throne. What's this? Luke chapter 16, verse 13. No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. And just in case you don't know what he's talking about, he clarifies it. You cannot serve both God and money. He didn't say it's not a good idea. He said you simply can't serve God and money. If God is on the throne in your heart and it's what you serve and it's the passion of your life, then there's no room for God. Hello? You cannot serve God and money. One will eliminate the other. And then he says, an accurately appraised money embraces the, abund the, the weaknesses that money has. Notice he says, command those who are rich in this present world. How many rich people here? You know the truth? We all are. You don't believe me? Go to Ecuador. Go to Nicaragua. Go to any other country in this world. There's some European countries that that are rich, but by world standards, everyone here is rich. You're filthy, stinking rich. Believe me, I can tell you stories. Those of us who have gone on the mission saying, we know what poverty looks like, and none of us have it, right? Command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. You see, uh, Hope in God, hope in money. I mean, know that word juxtaposition. You know what I mean? Juxtap you put one here and you put one here and you compare them. God, money. Who are you going to put your hope in? They're in juxtaposition to one another. Which one are you going to trust? You see, the problem with money is it's so unfaithful. Have you ever noticed how it leaves you? <laughs> Have you ever noticed how it's so unreliable? It's, it's just not faithful like God. When money becomes a God to us, we do not understand how terrible a God it makes. Say amen right there. <laughs> we don't understand how limited it is. We don't understand how flawed it is. I've sat with many people, and it's been a privilege, and I do not say that any other way except absolutely from my heart. I have sat with many people, and it has always been a privilege as I have sat with people as their life on earth is closing out. I have held their hand as they have drawn their last breaths. I have reached up and reverently closed their eyes for the last time. It's always a privilege. It's a very sacred moment. To date, I have never had one person in those closing moments look at me and say, I wish I had more money. Or I wish I'd have made more money. I wish I had more stuff. I've never had one say that. I've had them say, I wish I'd have been better to my wife. 
I wish I'd have been better to my husband. I wish I'd have spent more time with my kids. I wish, I wish, I wish. But no one's ever said, wow, if I had a few more zeros behind my bank account, my life would have been. It's never happened to me. What am I saying is don't overappraise money. See it for the limited thing that is. It makes a pretty good slave. It makes a terrible master. Amen? I can't wait on you, folks. I got to go. Number two, we have an obligation to enjoy money. Wow, now we're talking, aren't we? We have an obligation to enjoy money. Notice he said, command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us everything. Why? For our enjoyment. I have an obligation. Next time your spouse gets under you for spending money, say, I'm just being biblical. God has given me an obligation to enjoy money. When money is biblically managed, we can enjoy it. When it's not too important to us, we can enjoy it. That's the way, that's the nature of the beast. Watch this. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. How many think it would be real fun to wander from the faith and pierce ourselves with many griefs? Does that sound like any fun? Why do we wander from the faith and pierce ourselves with many griefs and not enjoy money? It's because money gets too important to us. The only way, and I lay some knowledge on here, <laughs> boom. <laughs> That's the sound of me laying some knowledge on you. Yes. Uh, you can never enjoy money if you're in love with it. You never can. Because like I said, it'll cheat on you. It's unfaithful. Money is kind of like having your favorite celebrity visit you. Wouldn't that be incredible? Yeah. Wouldn't it be incredible having John Wayne come, or, or, you know, <laughs> having some celebrity come. But if you were, fell in love with them, you'd spend the rest of your life heartbroken because they didn't stay with you. Money will not stay with you. It just won't. The only way you and I can enjoy money is to not fall in love with it. To understand how limited it is, to understand how, how what it can't do, and then we can enjoy it. Man, I can enjoy it. You know, I get a brand new compound bow that I get to hunt with. I can enjoy money. How about you? Oh, you want a new PlayStation or some weird thing like that, don't you? Uh, but, you know, a big screen TV, I don't know. But, but if you don't love it, you can enjoy it because it's not a God. It makes a terrible God. So God has commanded us to love it. Some of you ladies may be married to a guy who's so tight when he yawns his toes curl up. He can't go on a vacation because he's too tight to spend the money. Can I get away? No, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> he, he, can't, he can't enjoy it because he's too busy hanging on to it, you know? So, you know, you never get to go on a date not because it costs too much. Money can't love you back. Stop loving it. It will leave you without warning. And it will never deliver on its promise. You'll never be what money promises, but it will make you. So if you're going to enjoy it, don't love it. Amen? Number three, we have an obligation to share money. The Bible says doing something with your hands that he may have something to share with those in need. God designed us as believers not to be bought where treasure comes in and is locked down and never seen again. We were designed to be rivers that treasure flows through. And at times we share the blessings and the prosperity of God. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 17, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Listen, if you are a child of God and you've got some resources and, and there's people in need around you and you don't share it, how can you say the love of God is in you? How can you even begin? In fact, I, I think I'd like a little help preaching this point. Um, I have a little short video. I'm going to step aside and uh, just show that to you because I think this little experiment that some young people did says so much about sharing. We have it pretty much ready to go. Can I step aside and let you show that? Is there any way I could ask you to?
Anyway, I could have some food. I'm very really hungry. Thank you. Is there any way I could have some food? I'm uh, very hungry. Can I have some food? Hey, excuse me, sir. Are you hungry? Because we, we actually just bought some food to give to someone, and uh, we were wondering if you would like it. I mean, it's two burgers and fries and a drink. If Would you like it? All right, yeah, of course, man. Yeah, of course. Have a good day, man. Is there any way I could have some food? I'm really hungry. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. How long have you been out here? How long have you been out here? I've lived here a long time. Yeah. Excuse me, sir. Hey, I, I'm just paying it forward and I'm I'm actually just helping people that are in need and you know I want to give you some ten, like 10 bucks so you know you can yeah no problem man. Thank you brother. Have a great day. I'm not from around here man. Neither. No where are you from? I'm from Florida. Florida. Man how did you get out here? You don't happen, I mean, no. huh? you don't happen to have a, a dollar I, I could have? Yeah. A spare dollar? Yeah, you need a dollar for it. Hey, thank you so much. Yeah. God bless you. Yeah. You give me $10. Hey, thank there you. you go. Appreciate it. Don't worry about it. Thank you. What's your name? Jimmy. Jimmy? Jeremy. God bless you. Hey, Jimmy. Take care, okay? Yeah. Have a good one. Thank you. Sometimes those who have less share more. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes those who have very little are the most sharing people you will ever find. I often said the gospel of Jesus Christ is carried around the world in the backs of poor people. If something happens to us when we start getting quite a bit of money is we get a real hesitancy to share. And I think that Though I know that wasn't a scientific study, it illustrates what so often we give ourselves to pass. When I look around me in my world and I have some money in my pocket or in my bank account and I see people in need, I have an obligation. God has put an obligation. Amen. God has put an obligation in my life to minister to those needs to the best of my ability. You see, that's a financial obligation. It's part of good stewardship of my life before God. I have an obligation to share. Okay, are we ready to get back to the notes? Ready? Number four, we have an obligation to save money. And there's no contradiction between what I said and what this verse is. The Bible says in Proverbs 21 and 20, in the house of the wise there are stores of choice food and oil. In other words, there's a pretty good savings account. In the house of the wise there's a pretty good savings account. But a foolish man devours all that he has. A foolish man spends everything he has. Uh, we just let that soak in a minute. He simply is saying, I know that sometimes the Lord says, go all in. Give every, one, one time Jesus told the rich man to give, give away everything you have to the poor and come and follow me. And that didn't work out so good. But unless the Lord is coming along and saying that we have an obligation not to live hand to mouth. Come on. 
We have an obligation not to spend everything that God puts in our control. We have an obligation because that's what releases us to be good stewards and to be generous is having that extra amount. And some people say, as an act of faith, I live in poverty. That's not an act of faith. That's stupidity. Oops, I just made that. <laughs> that's foolish. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 5, 8, if anyone does not provide for his relative, especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So if I take my paycheck, if I take our paycheck, and I spend all of it, I am denying the faith because God said, I want you to take care of your family. I want you to have something in a savings account where if things go wrong, you're not on the verge of homelessness. You're not on the verge of hunger. I want you to have a savings account, right? You've never heard this before, have you? You just heard preachers that give it all away, <laughs> haven't you? Ooh. I'm feeling ornery. <laughs> Amazing what a man will say under the anointing. Uh, there was a study some years ago, and it was published in USA Today. I can't hardly believe it. And if you don't believe it, join me in going, are you sure? Because th but this is what they published. They said that 97% of Americans, 97% of Americans, the day they turn 65, cannot write a check for $600. 97% of us, the day we end our working career, are desperately broke. Again, 97%. Don't you know enough tightwads to think it's surely more than that? No, that was a joke. You guys are so serious. I'm afraid of you. 97%. Now, a lot of things can cause poverty, but can I quit preaching and just start meddling for a little bit? I'm going to anyway, so I, but I would like your approval. <laughs> I'd like your approval. I'd like your permission. Every time, 100% of the time, so far, my wife and I have been pastoring since August the 16th of 1981. Don't do the math. I was 11. <laughs> Every time, with apologies <laughs> to whoever may be offended by this, Every single time I have sat with a family and counseled them with their family finances and they are heading into bankruptcy without exception, it's not because of the cost of necessity. It's the spending of money on luxury. Every time. So far. Now, you know, if you lose your health and you lose your job and you have to file bankruptcy, I'm going to say, wow, you couldn't help that good. But so far, every family that I have ever seen in massive problems, it's because they spent too much on credit cards. They just went out there and melted those suckers down on stuff they really didn't have to have. I would never want to put my family on the verge of homelessness because I couldn't make mortgage payments or on the verge of hunger because I couldn't buy groceries because I had to have the, next new, the latest new trinket. Hello? I, I would never want to put my family in that because I had ventured out there and spent money recklessly. And that's why the courts, now again, I know some people are, are in bankruptcy because they lost their health, they couldn't, and please don't let me put any condemnation on you. I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the people that Solomon was talking about who just devoured everything they had just because it was there. Who just spent everything just because it was there. And I just want to share with you from a biblical perspective that you and I have a responsibility to secure the financial future of our family. To not put them on the edge of desperation. To not put them on the edge of a financial crisis. To be living in such a way that we are not always living hand to mouth and paycheck to paycheck. You can do it. Man, you guys are sawing up big time. Smile at me. This is why I wish there was a door right back there. <laughs> the most common way 
that finan- I'll give you, you won't even have to buy the book. <laughs> Books. Christian financial counselors will tell you this over and over again, that as a family, you should be operating on a 10, 10, 80 principle at least. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means you give away 10%, because that's what you were designed to do. And you save 10%, and you live on 80%. Right? You, you, you see, we've got this backwards. We buy a house and then try to pay for it. We should have decided before we ever bought the house if we could pay for it. Hello? We buy a car and then try to figure out how am I going to make those payments when we should have figured out what payment we could make and then bought the car. Hello? We buy a steak when a hot dog would have done. Not bologna. No one should eat bologna. That is not for human consumption. That's for your dog if you're mad at the dog. Can I get a witness? <laughs> no. No, no. The 10 10 80 principle. America has trouble distinguishing necessities from, from luxuries, and that's what's getting it. That's what's tearing us down. Uh, an undisciplined financial person will think, I'll just spend whatever I have. The Bible says that's foolish. A righteous person, a, a one using uh, intelligence, biblical wisdom, is going to say, you don't have a say this. Hello? Uh, so here's the bottom line with this one, and I'll get going. Before we have fun with money, we secure the necessities. That simple. Before we have fun with it, we secure the necessities. We make sure there's, there's, there's money there for the future. Number five, ready to move on? We have an obligation to leverage money for eternity. We have an obligation to leverage money for eternity. He says, I tell you, and the eye there is Jesus. Jesus said, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Now, isn't he saying, manage your money in such a way, notice he didn't say, if it is gone, he says, when it is gone. Because all of your money will eventually be gone. Even if you have it hoarded up somewhere in a safety deposit box, after you die, your family's going to fight over it, and then they're going to go blow it. Hello? Um, Use your money so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. So what I think he is saying there is manage your finances so that when you, the way you've managed it, the gospel gets to reach people that otherwise would not have been reached. And when you get to heaven, people will say, thank you for giving because when you gave, the gospel made it to me. The gospel went around the world and was always functioning in the body of Christ because people like you manage their finances in such a way to empower spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ to reach people for eternity. Um, you don't want to pause like this. I'm trying to get up the courage to get on this. That's just in case you don't know. Will you agree with me that Jesus said, leverage your finances so that when it is gone, people will be in eternity because of the way you've leveraged your finances, Right? And when it comes to that, in all these years, and, and this, this is just kind of extra, it won't cost you anything, except for whatever you think this is worth, um, I have found that believers, when it comes to their eternal responsibility with their money, usually fall into one of three categories. Would you like to hear what they are? Yeah. This is me having fun. Although it's not much fun right now. First of all, there's the tokens. Then there's the tippers. And then there's the tithers. The tokens, the tippers, the t- tips, and the tithes. Now, a token person tries to replace their financial obligation with some kind of token. Instead of giving their money, they give their time. At least they say they do. I've had people say, I just tithe on my time. I say, Really? What is 10% of 24 hours? What is that? 
Do you give that much to the work of God every day? Hello? I've never met someone who token time for tithes, say that three times, actually tithe time. It was a token. It wasn't a tithe. I must be anointed. You could not say that without God's help. Some people pick up a piece of trash on the way into the sanctuary and say, Oh, this ought to be worth something to God. I bent over and picked up some trash on the way in. I thought, that's worth five, five bucks at least. You know? My favorite tokeners, and I say that tongue-in-cheek, are the people who have an old piano in the basement. And it won't hold the tune anymore. And they come up in a pickup truck, rolling it out, saying, we decided to give this to God. We don't want it anymore. Really? Yeah, it won't hold the tune, but it'd be good enough for church. Hello? Okay. Try to replace our financial obligations to turn dollars into eternal gains with tokens. And you know what tokens really are? It's just an attempt to satisfy our conscience. It's just an attempt to say, I'm doing something, not me. You know? You ever have those buddies when you were a teenager that you'd all get together, and at least in the 70s when I was a teenager, shut up, uh, we, Pizza Hut was just coming to our area. We loved it, but it was expensive. And we'd, a bunch of us guys would go to uh, uh, Pizza Hut, and we'd order a big pizza, and we'd eat it. We had, I had this one buddy in particular, always, when we were tallying up the bill, he would reach in his pocket and pull his bill fold out, and look in it, and put it back in his pocket without paying any of the tab. I still know him for the tight was that he was. That's the token. Oh, don't have any today. This was going on in the Old Testament. I know we don't live on the Old Testament. Just to show you God's view of it, oh, Malachi chapter 1, verse 10 says, Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, I will, and will I, I will accept no offering from your hand. My name will be great among the nations. So he says, don't bring me any more tokens. Please, don't bring me any more tokens. Just shut the temple doors and don't light a fire on the altar, but don't bring me those, because my name is great among the nations. But you profane it, what, my name, by saying that the Lord's table, it is defiled, and of its food it's contemptible. And you say, what a burden. What an oppressive thing. I've got to give an offering to God. And you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. Are you having fun yet? When you bring injured, crippled, and diseased animals and offer them a sacrament, what are they doing? They're bringing tokens, not tithes. These are tokens, they're not tithes. Should I accept them from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed is the chief who has an acceptable male in the flock and vows to give it and then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king. He says, I'm worth more than that, says the Lord Almighty, and my name will be feared among the nations. They were giving God the cold, the crippled, the disease, and they sniffed at it. Ladies, what would you think if uh, you invited someone to dinner? And you laid this wonderful meal out before them, and they picked everything up and sniffed it. What do you think? You think this is good? Because he said they were sniffing contemptuously. I don't know if this is supposed to be. I don't really care about this. That's the way the Lord felt about them. He said, You sniff it there. And the, here's the kicker. He said, you're the one that brought the food. You brought the food. You brought that animal and you gave it to the priest and the priest butchered it and cooked it and now it's not good enough for you to eat. What are you doing? So, let's put this uh, up to the stage here. People who give tokens now, they fall into many categories. Some of them haven't been saved long enough to even know what they're supposed to do. I give those people a pass. 
Um, but if you've been saved long enough to know what the Bible says to you about giving, and you still refuse and you bring token, let's face it, you love money too much. Let's face it. Because a token is an attempt to black, black, black out the mirror. I don't want to look at myself in the mirror and say, I am too much in love with money, so I put a token between me and the biblical mirror and say, that's not who I am because I give a lot of stuff. Even though it's stuff, it's just a token. It's not good enough for us to keep. It's, it's something that we can call from being good at everything. Amen? Then there are the tippers. They give to the kingdom, they give to eternity, but they don't have the faith and maturity tied. They're experimenting with giving. They're not sure they can trust God. I'm not sure I understand them completely, though if it's between them and the Lord, I can't judge the heart. But it seems to me that tippers basically think God's a waiter. If I enjoy the music, I'll throw a few bucks that way. If the preacher did a halfway decent job and I've got a few dollars in my pocket, I'll throw some that way. They're just tippy. You know. I like the children's ministry. I'll throw a little few bucks that way. I like this. I, it's, it's not base. Worshipful tithing it says, God, I acknowledge you as the source of all that I have. Tipping says, God, if you serve me well, I'll throw a few dollars your way. See the problem with that? And to the tippers, maybe you don't know what the Bible says. In that case, read the Bible. Maybe it's a faith issue. You need to figure that one out. Or maybe you're so financially strapped that you just don't have a spare dollar to go in any direction. I don't know. But I would just leave you with this particular subject in uh, 2 Corinthians 9.5. I thought it would be necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance, to finish the arrangements for the generous gift you promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not one grudgingly given. God doesn't want you to give if you don't want to. You're ticked off, and you feel, I don't want to. Then do yourself a favor, put it back in your pocket. But remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Right? You give to God a tip, God may throw a little tip back at you. And whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each man should give what he decided is in heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. Now, in the Old Testament, you had to give whether you wanted to or not. You either paid a tithe or you were expelled from the community. You know, they, they, it was very legalistic. But in the New Testament, it says give joyfully. And if you can't give joyfully, then you can't give New Testament. If you can't love it, you, you can't give a New Testament. And then finally, there are the tithers. They use faith and obedience. They think for a moment that tithing existed before the law with Abraham. It existed during the law with Moses. And when Jesus talked about it in Matthew 23, 23, he said, this you should do. And they've decided, this is my responsibility and I will worshipfully do it. It's not a legalistic number. And I say this every year when I, when I preach the church series and it gets to this point, I say this every year, and it's not to say, hey, look at me. It's just to try and set an example. My wife and I, to the best of our knowledge, have never in our entire adult life earned a paycheck and not given a tithe off of that check back to God. I don't, remember, I don't think there's a single time. Am I legalistically superstitious about that 10%? No, it's just the standard. It's a standard. I don't know how much I owe God. I mean, God, God could demand it all and he would be justified, but I know that in the Old Testament he said a tenth is mine, so I take that to be. That's the standard. So if that's what he expected of Old Testament believers, he surely doesn't expect less of New Testament. So I just use it as a standard, a general rule. You know, I don't take my paycheck and move the decimal point and say, okay, I, I wait, I owe 23 more cents. It's, it's a basis to say this is apparently God's expectation. In verses way too numerous to mention, you see stuff like this from Leviticus 27.30. A tithe of everything from the land, whether it be grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. The entire tithe of the herd 
and flock, the tenth animal that passes under your shepherd's rod is holy to the Lord. And again, that's all over the place. I'm just saying that's the general standard that I look to and say, I, I think that's what God expects. Now, while I'm talking about the tithe here, I know I'm, you're running out of time, I want to flow right into the sixth and final point because they, they overlap very much. And that is the sixth obligation of finances for a New Testament believer is we're obligated to use worship, use money to worship. One of the most scandalous and yet biblical truths in the New Testament church is that we cannot separate worship from giving. We cannot separate the two. And I know people get mad all the time. There's no more controversial sermon you'll ever hear from this pulpit than this sermon, or one like this sermon. People get all weird when you start talking about finances, and yet it is so thoroughly biblical. Again, in passages too numerous to go over, we see things like in 1 Chronicles 16, 29, ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. See, that's an act of worship. Bring an offering and come before the Lord. An act of worship. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. See how those things are together in the mind of God. Paul wrote this in the New Testament. He says, the gifts, the offerings that you sent to Philippi, or to, to Macedonia, are a fragrant offering, acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. He said, when you gave to support the ministry of the Word of God, it rose up to God as a savor burning up into the presence of God. The writer of Hebrews says that tithing was an acknowledgement of God's greatness. Just think how great he was. Melchizedek, a type and symbol of Christ, even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the plunder. He said, this is how Abraham said to God, you are greater than I am. Now, there is one thing that is so thoroughly established, and again, I admit, so absolutely scandalous, is that God requires us to use our earthly treasures in our worship. Possibly because they are so close to our hearts. You see, are you listening? This is extra. Um, it doesn't matter how much your offering is worth to God. It matters how much your offering is worth to you. If I have to give God something impressive, I'm in trouble. What matters is he sees a heart in me that's willing to give up a prayer. When I was a kid, contrary to what all you good parents would do, I used to pray pocket knives. I love pocket knives. I wanted pocket knives for birthday, Christmas, pocket knives, pocket knives. AJ and our kindred spirits would come for pocket knives. Um, and I would trade around, and when I would trade around pocket knives with my friends, every once in a while, I would get one that my dad would go, ooh, that's a knife. You know what? I would always give it to you. Because if my dad appreciated it, no matter how much it was valued me, I thought, this is going to be a good trade. I love the affirmation of him saying, you have something of value. You see, friends, it really doesn't matter what you are giving or how much you are giving in the mind of God. What matters is that it, is it matters to you. Is it a treasure in your heart? The widow, with only a few pennies, gave more than anybody else because she gave out of her desperation. And here's something I don't know if you've ever noticed, that even worship in heaven involves offering. Even in heaven itself. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 4 that there were 24 elders surrounding the throne, and on each of their heads were golden crowns. Who needs a golden crown? Because he knew we'd be pressed. My opinion, I'm not sure, but I'm 99% sure. You can disagree, but you could be wrong. I'm pretty sure that they earned those crowns. I'm pretty sure that all the stuff they had done on earth when they got to heaven, 
Somebody set a golden crown on their head and said, this is what you earned with all of your faithfulness. And so they're sitting on this wonderful throne and they're wearing this golden crown. And so they're sitting there in all of their success and in all of their glory. And guess what they do? Let me read it for you. Revelation 4, 9. And the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him forever and ever and they lay their crowns before the throne. They're golden crowns that they have gone through. Lord knows what on earth to earn those crowns and yet they slide off of their thrones and they take those golden crowns and they give them as an offering to the one sitting on the throne. They lay the crowns before the throne and they say, You are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. About this time, in a sermon like this, at least some of you have decided you don't like me very much. Because I've been talking about the love of your life. The truth is, and I invite you to check my notes, to check my scriptures, and to do an exhaustive study from Genesis to Revelation, and tell me if this is not true. The idea that a person would worship God without bringing him an offering is alien to the Bible. It's just alien to if you are a non-giving worshiper, you're something the Bible never anticipated. Because even in heaven, offering and worship for heaven. Even in heaven. And the reason this bangs us around so much, Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, there's your heart can be. There's your heart can be. And that's what we're wrestling with today. Where is my heart? If you're a believer of any length, now this is between you and the Lord, and you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to argue with you about it or anything. It's between you and the Lord. I'm just preaching the truth to you as I understand it from the Word of God. But if you've reached a place where money is so important to you, but you can't release part of it to help win the world to Jesus. And there's a problem. If money is so important to you that you will leave here offended and not look at your own heart, money is way too important to you. It has become an idol to you. Now I asked you to do something when I started this message. I asked you, I told you, I'm going to ask you at the end of this, did Pastor Jeff preach the truth today? Answer that question. Regardless of how it hit you, regardless of how you feel about it, did Pastor Jeff preach the truth today? And I, I, I invite you, please, do me a big favor. If I'm wrong and you found it in Scripture, come to me, visit with me, love me enough to tell me that I'm all jacked up. Love me enough to do that for me. But I've been preaching to people, again, for a long time. And I've been doing stewardship series for a long time. And there's none that I dread more than this type of sermon because I know its potential to rub people the wrong way. And I like to be liked. But I don't like to be liked so much that I will compromise the church. If you're a believer with any kind of maturity on you, you are either a person who is giving tokens and making excuses for it because you love money too much to be faithful, or you're a tipper who thinks God's a waiter and you don't understand what a great God he is, and you think that you know, you'll go broke if, if you actually worship him through tithing, or you're a tither, and you have said, God, everything that I have belongs to you. Every paycheck that I got, 100% is because of your blessing. And I have no problem at all returning a portion of it to you. What a small thing. I have no problem at all 
you gave me these legs, these minds, these arms, this ability to earn this living, and for you to turn around and say, when you come before me, bring an offering that is consistent with how you feel about me. Don't bring me your junk, keep it. Don't bring me your excuses, keep it. But if you love me more than you love stuff, you worship for giving. You give generously. Give sacrificially. Give worship for living. Amen? Bow your heads with me, please.